With the drivers, thank everyone for tuning in. The Sirius XM Road Dog audience on channel 146. Our podcast audience, if you're on the live stream, if you're on TikTok, if you're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, we're everywhere because you're everywhere. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Dooner, your host. I just got back from an awesome, awesome trip down in Louisville. Excited to talk about it. We have some awesome guests on today. We're going to get a uh, review of a fuel cell. Let's jump into the rundown here. This is episode 697 of What the Truck. On it, I'm talking to Coyote Containers, William Hall, about their Nikola fuel cell EV truck. Now that Coyote Container has had the truck in service, how is it performing under real loads and well on real challenging loads like Donner Pass? We're going to get some first impressions, a little review, see how it's handling out in the field. I know a lot of you are curious about that one. Uh, Grace Sharkey, what is going on with my mouse here? Grace Sharkey, she, Freightways Grace Sharkey, she's here, I see her in the green room right now. We just got back from the Mid-America Trucking Show. She's got a trailer load full of impressions and takeaways from the largest trucking show on earth. Plus, we gotta break down a few headlines. Some stuff has gone on. There's a big ELD hack report that came out. There's a Project 44 versus Four Kites defamation case. We're gonna get all into it. And we got Trade Tech's Bryn Heimbach. He's breaking down port flows. We're gonna look at how volumes and lanes are shifting due to threats in the Red Sea, Panama Canal, and what's going on with that. But Grace Sharkey is here with us right now. So let's bring her up. Hey, Grace, good to see you again. Good to see you. I actually pulled out the good old uh, What the Truck shirt for you today, too. So Ooh, happy to school. be on. <laughs> old, old school look going on there, Grace. Uh, when did you get back from Louisville? I got back on, on Saturday. The great team at Truck Parking Club agreed to fly me back. I rode up with them, but then um, Evan over there was like, I don't think we're getting out at four today, Dooner. I'm going to get you a flight. I'm going to send you home. And good thing, because he didn't show up back at my house until 930 at night on Sunday when he dropped my gear off. He gets stuck out there. Yeah, you know, I uh, I flew back on Saturday afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, get to didn't get to see the truck beauty show, which we'll have to make time for next year. But uh, yeah, it's an incredible time, and I, it's an event that I I always love going to because it's as you and I both know of, of all the different type of uh, freight events that there are out there. This one is is the less uh, less suited and booted, a little bit more casual, and and because of that, we get to meet a lot of people that we don't normally get to talk to, and of course, radio guests that you, know, you never see face to face as well. So uh, I really enjoyed it, and and of course, shout out to Truck Parking Club. I mean, what a great booth they had, and wonderful time, of course, having you do the show live there too. Oh, of course. It was an amazing time doing it live there. We got a bunch of footage here to show you guys. We're talking about Matt's roll that tape. Yeah, here they were at 530 in the morning. Like you said, and if you guys saw the show on Friday, we did it directly from their booth. I think we had like nine guests on that episode. So much of the community was here. It was so well represented in a lot of ways. But you mentioned something interesting there too, Grace. You were like, yeah, it's a different crowd than we usually see at our events. And in a good way, but also a bad way. Like this is such an event with so many... I think people might have an impression it's just like 60,000 truck drivers, but there were like influencers, business leaders, a lot of major companies. But the only like real freight tech representation I saw were like the Uber freights of the world. There was truck stop there. There was a DAT, but there wasn't a ton of the stuff you might see at like an F3 or a manifest. Yeah, you know, I do want to touch on that, too, because I'm, I'm going to be writing an article about a few of the people I met there. And it's interesting because uh, there's still so many different marketplaces, like small marketplaces, like uh, Bulk Loads is one that's out there, True North. It's like small apps that the carriers are, are still using. So I think it's you see, of course, these big companies that you and I are used to having on our shows and, and in our articles. But it showcases, I think, still this like fragmentation. As much as there's that fragmentation throughout owner operators, like it's still this fragmentation of, of tech and, and companies out there that people can can chat with. So, and and on top of that too, you get to dive into a little bit more of their lifestyle, right? Like there's mattress providers there, there's different Chrome uh, providers there, and and just different aspects, even more of like the engineering side of the truck. That's really interesting to, to check out. That's an awesome clip right there too. Yeah, that was a truck pull. That was Joey Slaughter. He got in that event. Actually, I think that happened on Saturday night. I was already out 
of the event at that time. That's the only thing I was a little remiss. But you know what? It gives me a reason to come back. And I certainly think I will next year. I don't know why it's taken me so long to get out to Gats Grace. I had the, the team out last year. I had Justin out last year and we did a show. But I wasn't on the ground. And you have to be on the ground at this thing. You got to feel that energy. And like you said, you see so many parts of like the truck and so many companies that touch some aspect of truckers or the trucking community there that you would never think of unless you were in that giant exhibit hall. Oh, uh, definitely. And, and, and a lot of different problems come up there too. Like not only was there people talking about recruiting issues, but recruiting engineers. And I mean, we'll get to it in a second when we talk about some of these articles, but recruiting tech people to, to help out now at trucking companies as we become more more technology driven uh again of course the eld side of that soon but uh, i love this is first of all this, this is the funniest <laughs> clip of all time this I've is why you got to go with there right grace because the dancing yeah, yeah, trucker was there <laughs> <laughs> when the dancing trucker stops by the booth and says dance like you you have to i've watched this clip uh close to 50 times every time it makes me laugh harder and harder between Hunter, between yourself, between the Yeti back there, killing it, by the way. I, I it's the funniest thing I've seen, for sure. What was your, what, what was the takeaway you had from the event? What, what was something that, that really stuck out to you? You know, one thing that I was talking to a few drivers about is I, I got a chance to sit inside the FMCSA's uh, chat about a leasing issues. And what was very interesting about it is I think especially kind of the rhetoric we hear among truck drivers is that that group, that uh, truck leasing task force, they, they know that problem well. And of course, the audience had some great things to add about it. But what was interesting is, it's like, you know, I used to work in government and government is just sometimes so slow. And what, what made me happy was knowing that those leaders and people on that task force know what the problems are in truck leasing. But what kind of, if I'm going to say like, was a little bit of an ick about it is that, you know, how slow it's going to take. Okay, if we know what these problems are, why aren't we actually working on legislation or regulation or something and having a, a bigger discussion on it? And I think from there, they go into a study and it's just, it's just frustrating sometimes to see that the bureaucracy kind of like take place and it be so slow, but it is positive to know that at least those people on that task force understand the problems with it. We're open to all of the comments that people had yeah. and hopefully we can start to see. Were they, on that. were they, I don't know if that's true, Grace. Yeah. I have a report from the field. I have a counter narrative for you. I had a truck driver say he went over to the FMCSA's booth and wanted to talk to him about speed limiters and he got escorted away. <laughs> Now that uh, that's a different topic, and maybe that's one in particular uh, we should probably get uh, to talk about that one. Uh, Oida is Todd Spencer on that aspect is a little bit different, but at least on the leasing side of things, I think they had a good a good group of people together to get things done. But again, it goes back to like how fast is this going to get done so that people every day aren't getting themselves trapped in these awful leasing programs as well. And so again, yeah. And <laughs> the speed limiters, I agree. I, that's a totally different topic and we could go down that route. And I agree with you. It's not, it's, they're not uh, teaming up with drivers and, and that stance as much for sure. But the leasing side, we'll, we'll keep our eye on it as a editorial group over here and, and see, maybe we see a speed up on that. Oh, it should put speed limiters or extenders on the leasing aspect of things <laughs> and not uh, close it down for, for drivers out there. What was your favorite thing you saw at the events? I really like the trucks outside. Obviously, for me, it was that that Maxim Overdrive truck in terms of like things, in terms of just people. It was like the whole community, just the whole online community, oh. especially the people we won't tip. I mean, at F3, we saw a lot of these these guys because we made an effort to invite the trucking community out there. But in general, you don't see a lot of these, the, the people that are in our freight community at these types of, uh, at industry events, unless it's something like Matt. So it was really cool to see like 30, 40 of them all together and just hang out with everybody, have some of them on the show, find out what everyone's doing and see how everyone operates a little bit yeah you know i'll i'll give you a kind of a serious answer and a non-serious answer the serious answer as the kids and the families uh i was watching of course truck parking club had this really cool truck right that you could like work in on and parking and it was just like a kind of little uh, uh test truck and i was watching a girl and her dad and her and she was just like killing it driving this thing around and i overheard her talking about with her dad like if that's something that she could do and she's older and that's like all the work that we talk about getting more women in trucking and, and just kind of 
I was talking to, I think, St. Christopher's, and we're looking at this big group of kids that Next Gen had brought in uh, just to, to the event to, so they could see what was happening. And I think sometimes we forget, it, you know, all the work that we do, it's, it's actually the next generation that's going to be hauling our economy as well that we should probably be considering too. So to see like all the families there and the generations that we'll likely see in trucks here in the next uh, couple of decades was like, I just think really exciting. Uh, and, and that's another really great thing you don't see at a lot of the events that we go to as well. On a non-serious note, uh, tanker trucks are really cool. Okay. Uh, going through the, tr the truck beauty show, I think I w I'm, I'm one over by the tanker trucks. I want one. I can't, <laughs> don't have a CDL, so I couldn't drive but, but boy, were there some beautiful takers out there, that's for sure. I mean, the logistics of just getting those show trucks to the event is, it, is its own thing. I was watching some of the tow trucks that handle them. I mean, when you go to these show things, you can tell these things are driving. Just look at the tires. Like when you go over, they have brand new sparkling tires. They're all super detailed. That whole process is a thing unto itself. But speaking of beauty and, and show ponies, I took a poll. Which industry conference type has the best look? And you know, the trucking show won. The, the jeans, the hoodie, and the sneakers. And Grace, as you know, when you go to these events, there's like everybody kind of, like 80% of the people all look exactly alike in a certain way. Like they all dress the same. <laughs> when you go to a regular like a logistics show, I'm sure if you've been like the global trade ones, it's all ill-fitting suits. Right. It's all like yeah. ill fitting suits, ugly, uh, ugly loafers, things like that. And then you go to a freight tech event and like 80 percent vest, jeans and sneakers. My audience picked the trucking show. They went with with a about 60 percent. said that's got the best look. What do you say? It's definitely, I mean, A, it's so much easier to, to pack for this. Like, I was, I actually told Reed that he called me, like, the night before, and I'm like, I'm sitting here looking at the suitcase, just taking stuff out of it, because it's like, it's, you know, just a few days, it's I'm so relaxed and casual, you're, talk about walking, I don't think people understand how big this thing is, this is the biggest conference that I ever go to, and uh, I would love, I didn't keep track of my steps, but I wish I would have, because uh, walking from where the truck parking club is, to where a lot of the pro talks are, Boy, uh, miles uh, were walked, that's for sure. Doesn't your phone do it for you? My, my top day, I think, was uh, 16,000 steps, which also makes, like, I don't know how people, you know, people are like, you got to walk 10 to 15,000 steps a day. And I'm like, how the hell is that possible? I literally have to walk around <laughs> a conference all day long from like six in the morning <laughs> until seven o'clock at night to get that many steps in. Like, how is this humanly possible? Yeah, totally agree. I mean, I think I saw you and I was like, all right, I'm going to see you guys walk all the way to the women in trucking and then get back in time to see your show too. And it's, uh, uh, and plus the distractions of running into people. It's, it's, it's really tough um, to do. So that's my, that's my main tip too. That's why this is yeah. so easy to do. I've made this mistake myself on the first day. It's so easy to see someone a little bit away from you or a little bit afar, or maybe a booth or something you want to check out and you go to yourself. Well, I'm here a couple more days and I'll go check it out later. Don't do that because it, when there's 60,000 people, it's just a giant sea of humanity. You end up in all different sides of the building. The people end up separated from you. Take your shots when you want to take them or else you're, uh, or else you're going to miss out. Grace, uh, you also stayed in a haunted house, didn't you? How did that go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, side hobby I have is I like to go check out haunted places. And uh, in Louisville, they actually have one of the world's most haunted uh, uh, tuberculosis hospitals. Uh, it's abandoned now. And uh, actually, it was really great. <laughs> Thank you for asking. It was uh, we had some really interesting uh, flashlight activity uh, and, and shadow activity and, and all that stuff. So uh, for anyone that goes out to the show, if you're into ghosts, like we're about 10 minutes out of town is is a place you can go check out on, on Fridays as well. So that, that went really well. And uh, I've got some some uh, recordings to listen to. I'll, I'll send you some fun stuff for sure. <laughs> Any Anything you thought might have been paranormal? Oh, for sure. Uh, I, I've been there twice, actually. And uh, so a lot of times we use flashlights to answer yes or no questions. And wow. that happens. Uh, like with the ghosts? That, You're like answering yes. their question. Okay. Uh, they actually turn the flashlight on and off. Can, you, uh, can so, you ask one of them if they'll come on this show? Yes, yeah. I'll next. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. I don't know how a flashlight answer would play with the radio audience or the podcast audio audience. We'll find out. Hey, speaking of, we got a couple of headlines, too. And I was on the floor with you when, when this sort of came over the wire. And you're like, ah, dude, I got to go in the media room. I have to write an article. Project 44 versus Four Kites. There has been some <laughs> developments in this case. What's next, Grace? 
So this is really exciting. Honestly, I'm surprised how quick they came to this decision. I was expecting this to maybe take a little bit longer, but nope. They the court sided with them completely. To give a little bit of background uh, about. I mean, this shows to you how long this has been going to. In 2019, uh, P44 sued four kites for uh, defamation for, of course, sending uh, a, a number of uh, high level executives emails from an unknown email source and fake address say yeah fake addresses uh, check out the article uh, it's it's again not in the court yet but it alludes to the ceo of four kites sending emails with a number of employees uh, from their india ip uh, regardless of that so uh four kites fought it saying that it didn't fit the defamation uh clause that they're basically going to as a defamation per se is what they call in illinois yeah. Uh, and then it went to a higher court. The higher court actually said that was wrong and sided with P44, which means it then went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court came back and said, yeah, this is defamation per se. You can move forward with it. And the interesting part with that, too, is that uh, P44 doesn't have to prove the damages that they're looking to get as well. So uh, the interesting about this for those companies in Illinois, you now can uh, say that your company and the individuals in your company are technically a third party if there is a defamation situation like this in the future so it does set this precedent and yeah. it's gonna move forward in court too so matthew see, grace matthew leffler yeah. matthew leffler said this is the most important corporate defamation case in the u.s because of what you just mentioned there because it allows internal like communications internally to count as yeah. publishing and could be used in defamation so be careful who you're reaching out to don't send everything company-wide you actually could be lying if you send something to, you know, an entire company's list bashing that company, especially if it's proven to, to be false. Britain Ladd said every customer of Four Kites should immediately put a plan in place to dump Four Kites and transfer their business to Project 44 or another company. Is the situation that bad for Four Kites? So uh, it's, we'll see what happens in court, what comes out. I uh, because if you've watched this historically, I don't think it's going to be a settled situation. I don't think we're, it would be smart, I think, for four kites to try to settle in this situation so it doesn't go to court. But I don't know if it's going to end as, as, as happily as they would hope, uh, clearly. Uh, probably a discussion they should have had a while ago. But uh, I, I agree. I mean, there's a level of this where, especially our generation, right? And you see this in even when you're looking at groceries and CPG companies and, and retail, like there's a level of you, your ethics as a company that people like to follow. And if you are someone who's looking at the integrity of a company and, and the leadership behind that as well, uh, and of course we'll get into some da data issues here in a second, then you want to make sure you're working with the right people. And I think this is, if you look into the case and look into the, the work that we've done covering it, you're going to find some really shady stuff there. And do you want the person providing you with your, your visibility uh, data and, and analytics, et cetera? Do you want them to have the same ethics as, as your company that you value? So uh, I, I don't, as a journalist, want to say which to choose. I sure. want to kind of say right there, but I do want to say, I think ethically, this is a, this is one that people should consider as well. Should keep an eye on. Well, you mentioned data, more data, more problems. There's a big report that came out about an ELD hack. It's a truck to truck worm. This is, uh, by the way, welcome to the company, Brimley Heinemann. This, uh, she yeah. reports that Colorado State University researchers have found that ELDs are potential cybersecurity threat vectors. Go figure. Anything connected is people. Researcher Jake Jepson, Rick Chacharji, Ch and Jeff Daly uncovered ELD vulnerabilities that could lead to unauthorized control of vehicles systems and data, as well as widespread free fleet disruptions, product designers, programmers, engineers, and consumers should raise awareness of these vulnerabilities and encourage development of safer ELDs, the February paper says. And Grace, this is pretty crazy because they say they're doing this. You can be up to 120 feet away. They're doing with Wi-Fi at truck stops, anywhere, the distribution centers, anywhere that trucks can congregate. But also, they managed to follow one in a Model Y with a laptop, with a Wi-Fi signal sent out and it only took 14 seconds to hack into one of these ELDs. Then what it does is once you hack that singular ELD, it goes to that truck stop and then it distributes that worm to everything else. Yeah, uh, this is terrifying. You see this actually is an issue even with uh, like more some of the cars that are more electric or 
uh, like Tesla's and things of that nature, right? Anything that has this connectivity, this blue, your anything that has a Bluetooth really put into it is a, this could possibly happen with. And I think it's it's an area that our industry really isn't considering as much as I think they should. The uh, the, the group that uh, the NMFTA, right? They are huge on this problem. If you are a carrier out there and you're wondering what steps do I need to take to avoid this happening. I would highly reach out to them and their cybersecurity team. We've had them on, they've been on this show. They've been on a number of our programs in the past talking about problems like this. This is going to happen more and more. And, you know, I brought up earlier kind of the the shortage of within recruiting of engineers is, is a problem right now. Boy, talk about the future of trucking. People need to be really considering who's running uh, not even just like their IT, but their their systems, right? As No doubt, company, Grace. Whether yeah, one, two trucks, up to 50, any size, Ma- you got to consider Ma- this, So Matthew Leffler says, yeah. we must end self-certification of ELDs by manufacturers. This is the calm before the storm. The FMCSA yeah. is the best possible position to regulate this effectively. John McClymon said, this is what happens when everyone and their cousin was allowed to build them. And Daniel Kors says, hey, FMCSA, I just found my new logbook. Let's see them show the picture, please. Let's see them hack this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and Rona Research, if you can code it, you can hack it. Something to remember when some clown wants to put a microchip on your toothbrush to enhance the user experience or in your brain or in your brain. Grace, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Everybody catch Grace articles on FreightWaves.com. Check out all of her shows on FreightWaves Podcast Network. And of course, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, check her out on Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking. Take care, Grace. Thanks, Studer. Have a good day. Take it easy. All right. Meanwhile. What a magic trick. <laughs> Lloyd Legal says, where'd he go? <laughs> Ooh. Daniel Ward says, David Blaine has got nothing on these guys. You can see his belly. Well, I don't see Bryn here, but you know what? I do see a gentleman who's been waiting very, very patiently. Let's bring him up. William Hall, managing member and founder at Coyote Container. Mr. Bill, how are you doing today, sir? Hey, Bill. Hey, Tim, how are you? What is up? Where are you sitting right now? Anyway, I always love you come. You come in full work regalia. You come in a working truck. You're always <laughs> dressed to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the uh, the Nicola Trey, my new truck. I got it in uh, mid-December. It's, uh, I, I mean... If you want to see the outside view of it, here it is. <laughs> Got the foamy truck. It's a it's a beautiful little truck. What, so what part of the world? For those who haven't met you before, just give yourself a quick intro one more time. Yes, uh, I'm Bill Hall with Coyote Container. I do drayage uh, and side loader work uh, here in the port of Oakland and uh, through California. We I also service um, L.A., Long Beach, uh, and points in between and points uh, west. We go out to Reno as well, doing drayage with containers. So um, we got the first um, uh, Nicola Trey sold in California. It's VIN number 11. Whoa. I think they built 10, 10 demos. And then this one was the first one. Uh, we, and I put it in service pretty much in the middle of January. And we're, we're, we're coming up on 10,000 miles with the truck. So it it's just been uh it's fantastic it's my favorite truck it's the one i want to get in every day it's it's just been it's been great um there's there's been some issues you know no doubt um a couple of show stoppers but um nothing that left me uh in, in a disadvantaged place uh <laughs> i was very fortunate um and Kind of the cool thing is when you have a problem with this truck is you have the battery reserve uh, that'll take you, you know, 18, 20 miles uh, to a safe spot. So if the fuel cell gives up the ghost, you've you've got a little extra buffer there uh, to get you get you to a safe place. Well, let me um, let me ask you about it. how long did it first of all, how long did it take to get it? So you mentioned you got it in January. You've had it for a couple of months now. How long did it take from when you ordered it to you actually have received the truck? It's um, we uh we, I began this process a long time ago, but um, from really the time of ordering, when the trucks were starting to be produced, uh, it didn't take long at all to get the truck. Um, it, we applied for the HVIP and the IESEF, the vouchers uh, that are provided by the state to help finance the truck because it's it's much more expensive than um, a, a normal truck. So. Uh, 
to get the ball rolling in California with hydrogen, you know, the state is providing incentives and they're, they're targeting those incentives. Uh, the best incentives are for the drayage industry um, that, that they have. And, you know, you can, you can get up to, um, y you know, 90% of the cost of the truck, which is, which is amazing. Is that yeah, you so driving here, around? Is that you in it right now? Yeah. Yeah. That's the truck. It's going through a Marine terminal here in Oakland um i'm sorry about all the bug splatter on the windshield but we just came back from reno and i'm dropping an empty in the port um kind of give everyone an idea what what drayage truckers really do you know here we are up at the at the uh, pedestal the in gate scales uh you wait your turn and then um as soon as they clear you you you, you go in and uh th now this is a very large terminal um this is down the empty lane. Go down here to a little truck. He gives you actually a post-it note to tell you where to go. That's what everyone asks me. How do you know where to go? Like, yeah. The guy hands me a little post-it note, <laughs> if you can believe that. Um, High tech. And High tech. You're, you're driving yeah, in the future, but you're, you're, ro you're running with post-its. Yeah, post-its, yeah. Actually, it's pretty efficient. Is this your, is this yeah, your daily so driver now? So you got this in January. You're taking it into the ports. Are you using this thing every day? I use it pretty much every day. Um, I've had one one load that was uh, because it's heavy a heavier truck than most. Um, I've I've had to do one load with a diesel, um, but other than that, it's it's uh, it's been able to carry everything. And you know, kind of surveying the industry and talking to people, they say, okay, well, Bill, you might be giving up ten percent of your cargo because the truck is heavier, um, but but beyond that, it's it's been great. I've been busy. More people want. Uh, uh, you know, zero emission services. Um, there we are, we're at uh, first element fueling and they're still under construction right here in the port. Uh, that's a Hyla fueler that's out in Ontario, California in the LA basin. Um, there's the truck, it's a cab over and I'm splitting it there for the uh, inspection. There we are with the hammer, side loader. And if you pause. Oh, we lost Bill. We should be able to bring See, him back. Oh, here it comes. Hey, Bill, we got you. you we back? lost you for one second. You're back. I'm sorry. You're, you're here. You're I've here, Bill. Karate. Bill, you're here. Oh, no. Did Bill lose us? We're looking at Bill's truck, the hammer right here. Bill, you still got us. That's the hammer right there. So Bill was on the show before. He used this device. This is how he picks containers up. Guys in the back, if you can get Bill back up here. I don't know if his uh, headset disconnected, perhaps. We'll try to get him back up on the air. But uh, he's been running this thing. He said about 10,000 miles, and I hope we can because I'd really love to know the, uh, the the cost on this thing, the weight. He mentioned that there were a few issues. I would love to know. Hey, Bill, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. So, hey, as I was just telling the audience as we were waiting to get your sound back up on here, I was super curious. How much did this thing cost you? Okay, so... Um it, it, it varies depending on when you buy it. I think the price has been has been going up. I think you're north of 450 now. Um, with the vouchers, you know, they will cover, uh, you know, 90% of that if you put them together in the right manner. There's also the Volkswagen uh, fund also that if you have an older uh, vehicle that you're replacing um, and, and decommissioning uh, before engine manufacturer, before 2012, you can get additional funding there. So, uh, you know, kind of what I say is you can buy this truck for less than you can buy a new truck. Um, and it's just a, it's a beautiful truck to drive. I mean, it's just so smooth and quiet. Um, it's, 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 it's heavy. You hardly, it's got a lot of power. You hardly know you're pulling a trailer, honestly. Um, what is the, it, you mentioned it, heavy. What's the weight difference between this and uh, like a traditional diesel of, of a similar caliber? Okay, so this truck is I uh, cat scaled is twenty seven thousand pounds, twenty seven two with my chains on the back for going over Donner Pass. Um, it's it's uh, significantly heavier. You know, a drayage truck can be fifteen thousand pounds. Uh, my two trucks are eighteen one and nineteen six for the full uh, sleeper Kenworth sleeper that I have. Uh, so it's. There is a weight disadvantage, you know, in your ability to carry cargo and, you know, some of the the upper end containers you, you will not be able to carry with it. Um, I think there's, you know, I've gone to 44,000 pounds gross container weight and that maxes out my axles uh, there. I think with a spread axle, I can get 48,000 
uh, uh, gross container weight, you know, and then plus you have the 6,600 pound chassis. So it's not bad. It's really, when I look at all the loads I've carried, there's only a few I couldn't get today um, with this truck. So that's been really positive. And, you know, the customer demand is, is there. The zero emissions or green companies out there that realize that this is, is what's coming. Uh, one of the questions I get asked is how much is the fuel? And that's something you really have to uh, study before you buy one of these trucks. Uh, you know, talk to the fuel suppliers, you know, Hyla, uh, First Element, Shell are some examples. You know, take, you know, kick the tires on the fuel and, and try to get yourself maybe a contract that gives you some sort of stability. Fuel is more expensive than diesel fuel right now. Though the yeah, future does... Like Bill, I was seeing like 16, around $16 a kilogram. Is, is that right? Do, do, have you uh, done any that, testing to see how many miles you get per kilogram? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, that I don't know um, in terms of the price. Again, there's, y y you know, I think these things are being arranged at the time of sale. Yeah. And, and you really need to, you need to get with the, with the seller and, um, and, and perhaps go out to the fuel companies yourself, make sure that it's gonna work for your, your market service. Again, the, the projections are that those prices are gonna come down uh, over time as more production comes. And that's kind of what we see here is that there's not enough production and you know, if they could easily, they could easy, easily build a lot of these trucks and put them out here, but the fuel has got to catch up. So, um, and people are coming there. I get a lot of people that just call me and ask me, is this truck for real? I mean, does it really work? <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. And they're, and they're fuel suppliers and, and people that are doing things in the fuel end, and they want to know whether they should be coming here to set up. And, you know, there's, there's three different ways to make this fuel. Well, there's many different ways, but the most common is steam reformation with natural gas. Um, there are, uh, and that's very inexpensive. It's like, you know, maybe 250 uh, uh, a kilogram. Uh, then, then you get into it with carbon capture, uh, electrolysis, which is using solar panels and electrolyzers. That's the most expensive way, but uh, they say $10 a kilogram to produce that. Uh, and then everything in between, there's pyrolysis. Um, there's pyrolysis that produces actually pure carbon uh, that can be used uh, in, in other applications. So it's, there's a bunch of people now that they realize the trucks are here, there's a market, I think they're coming. And for the first time since the horse and buggy and the sailing ship, you know, uh, carriers are realizing that they can make their own fuel. And that's that's a that's a revolution really in the in the entire industry is that you know a carrier can decide to go up and, and set up his own production uh, that would give him a huge market advantage down the road. So um, these Bill, things are all just. I'm curious how what, what kind of how are you challenging it? You mentioned Donner Pass in the email you sent me. You mentioned putting some chains on it when you're loading it up. How is this thing moving when it's under a load? It's it it's great. Uh, you hardly know the trailers there. It's very very smooth. Um, and it's a very soft ride. It's the softest ride I've I've been in in terms of a driver um, and com comfort. It's got a great turning radius. You know, going over Donner Pass, I was kind of worried, but I've been over. Um, you, you know, I'd been over the Grapevine and Tejon Pass. You know, four or five times. And actually, Donner seemed a little easier because it's it's more spread out. The the ascent is more spread out. And what you worry about in in that climb is really the your battery, your state of charge of your battery. So you've got the fuel cell and you've got the battery. And when you're drawing more load on an incline, a grade, the battery starts to deplete. And in this truck, I'm told that even if you deplete the battery all the way, the fuel cell will continue to uh, operate the truck where some others that are in beta now I hear they they just stop and you have to wait and recharge the batteries so this truck is 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 great they've figured that problem out and uh, it'll climb and it'll climb Donner no problem so what, what kind of range good. are you sort of averaging on a full tank with this okay so it holds 70 kilograms and uh, the stated range is, is 500 miles. And it's like, if you look at my fuel curve there, it, it, you know, it varies. You can get uh, 12, 14 miles per kilogram if you're bobtail. And, uh, you know, with a full load, I was down at six and a half uh, miles per kilogram. So, you know, it varies. It's, it's just like a diesel truck in that regard. Um, it, it depends what kind of load you have. So it's, I've always, 
I, I, I almost ran out of fuel coming back from Oakland. I mean, coming to Oakland from LA, uh, but I still had 28 miles of range when I got here. I just had to slow down <laughs> to make sure I didn't <laughs> run out of fuel, <laughs> but I made it. So H- have you yeah, fought any we, weather? You said Donner, there was an awful snowstorm on there. You didn't get stuck in your fuel cell EV out on that. Did you? Yeah, no, I didn't. I came through there the day after and I don't know what it is it's like a snowstorm is like fly paper for truckers i they just if there's a snowstorm coming they'll head for it you know and i think a lot of guys got stuck in that uh, unfortunately uh, but yeah I, I went through the next day the roads were well actually it was two days two days later the roads were fine um i always try to time that if i can uh, avoid it but there's a lot of guys that you know they're they're going they they can't they can't avoid it so um they they got stuck waiting what would you like to see fixed or improved in the truck yeah i i honestly uh i don't have any any things that 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 i really i mean the weight i think that's that would be the 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 major thing i mean and i know that they're all working on that so this is the first if you want to equate it, it's the first iphone you know and there's going to (laughs) be yeah there's going to be a lot of improvements and so we know that um uh they get the hydrogen supply out here and um you know that would be the other thing would be more hydrogen stations there's only really two that i visit now one is the the first element which is should be finished i'm kind of getting it out of the back door there and uh the the hyla uh station that's in ontario and i think they're adding more stations in in the la basin so there'll be more more choices for commercial trucks you, you can't really go to a you know, a standard hydrogen station with the tr- with the truck. They're they're not designed to to uh, provide the volume that we require. So you know, a car uses a Mirai. You know, takes three or four kilograms, and and we take fifty. So that you yeah. know, that's the big difference. Phil, before I let you go, score out of a hundred, zero to a hundred, hundred being the best overall. Kind of an informal score. What would you give the truck? I I give this ninety nine percent. I mean, oh. Yeah, it's a great truck. And once you drive it, you you won't want to drive anything else. It's just that nice. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was so awesome to talk. How do people find you? How do they reach out to you? Uh, coyotecontainer.com. Um, and uh, also you can find me on Loadmatch. You know, if you search uh, for zero emissions uh, in, in Oakland, you'll find me. Hey, Bill, thank you so much. I'm going to let you get back behind the wheel of that fuel cell EV over there. Have a great yeah. ride, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Tim. It's a pleasure being on. Take care. All right. Speaking of green EVs elsewhere, take a look at this guy right here. Joseph Smith says, well, look on the bright side. He'll always be in the shade. We're looking at a truck here that's got a, a giant tree stuck to the side of it. Uh, sea of Rust says, new green emissions truck. Daniel Sater says, this is Groot taking lift. Chad Jaff- Jacobson says, branching out. And uh, Chasen Thacker says, this driver is all bark. And no bite. All right, let's talk about, we have we have just a little bit of time left, but Bryn Heimbeck is here. He's president and co-founder at Trade Tech. Bryn, great to see you. Hey, Tim, thanks. I'm uh, really happy to be here and big fan of your show. Thanks for letting me on. Well, I appreciate it. For people who may not be familiar with you and Trade Tech, what's like the quick elevator? Elevator is we're a platform, a uh, software platform for international trade, moving freight, uh, mainly ocean, uh, but it's coordinating between the trucks on both sides of the water and the and the shipment and uh, getting stuff in and out of customs. Now, what what is that looking right now? Stuff coming in and out of customs. We have a chart here that's looking at some containerized import volumes. It's uh this we just had a state of freight. Our fa- CEO and founder Craig Fuller and Zach Strickland they were trying to make sense of the U.S. domestic market, and I think the conclusion was nobody really knows. Now we're looking at some ocean trade here. What is this chart telling you, Bryn? So if you look, if you look at the red um, line, that's two, 2020, and right about July, that's where we started hitting congestion in the ports. Well, if you follow where you look at the blue line with this little circle around it, that's February of 2024, and if you follow it across to June, July, here we are in slack season, and we're right at that level where volumes create a congestion in our ports. Um, I guess, unfortunately, we're in slack season and uh, usually volumes go up from here. 
So, you know, there's been the disruptions, obviously, with the Red Sea that is shifting trade lanes and volumes, Panama Canal water levels. We hear so much about that. In fact, there was a very dark headline. It wasn't on Freightways, but it was about a week ago. And it was like Panama deciding whether people can like drink or put water in the canal. It was it was so uh, it was so strange. But what are like sort of the real world impacts that you are seeing from these two concurrent disruptions? Look, on the on the Suez, not much. That's yeah. really Far East Europe uh, traffic. You don't have a whole lot that's hitting us on the West Coast. And we're talking about port congestion over here. But the Panama Canal it really just cuts off all of um, the strategy that people put in place to, to take um, cargo directly to the East Coast or to Houston uh, and skip the West Coast last time around. And that's just not going to be an option. Man, I'm sure that the port directors over in the West Coast are not too upset about that, but are they prepared? I think there was an, a trade alert. It was either last week or two weeks ago that I was talking about Port of Vancouver was picking up volume. It was getting more congestion due to some of these lane shifts. Is this a trend? It sounds like you think this is going to continue. Will it go down, though, to Port of Los Angeles, Port of Long Beach? Well, if you look at uh, there was an article last week that said that um, one lines terminal that the the rail network there had backlogs for the last four or five weeks not congestion that starts with a c it was b <laughs> backlogs are they better in the in the in the hierarchy of things a shipping manager doesn't want to hear are backlogs better than congestion evidently i think so i mean <laughs> well look one way or the other it, it, we're probably going to face this and the bad news is we got some congestion coming I think there's a good news side of it, and that is a crisis like this is going to drive a change in the market that's going to be good for us overall, and in particular for the trucking community, the drayage trucking community. You know, it's Brad Jacobs from XBO, brilliant leader, multi-billionaire, serial entrepreneur. He was at one of our FreightWaves events, and I remember asking him what kind of market is the best. And he said, uh, it doesn't matter. He said a bad one or a good one. He said the middle market is what's terrible because there is, there's no way to make money. He said disruption is what makes you money. So the, the thought of disruption isn't necessarily a terrible thing to the, uh, the LSP side, although it may be for the shippers. Should they be concerned, those shippers? Look, they're going to have to change. Um, and, and, and as I said, the good news is going to be for the truckers. The ports aren't efficient um, handling the cargo that's coming in for a reason. They don't know when, it's, when the container comes in. They don't know when it's going to leave the terminal. They, they got it figured out on the outbound side. They can load those ships in, in a day or two. But on the inbound side, they don't know. The cargo comes in. It clears customs. Uh, we did some stats. Only 40% in the best case scenario um are where the shipments are cleared before they get off the ship so the ports waiting around they can't play plan their stack so they stack the containers five high and one in five chance uh they're lucky and the trucker that just came in the gate takes one on top four and five chance they're gonna have to dig and then the more congestion there is the more they have to dig the longer the wait times for the truckers you know, it's funny, Bill, when Bill Hall was on, he was showing off, he got one of those new fuel cell EV. Nicholas, speaking of new regulations and drayage and all that stuff over in SoCal and California, actually Bill's up in NorCal over there, but he was saying like, he goes into the port and they just hand him a post-it and they're, they're like, that is the tracking situation that they give to truckers. They hand him a post-it and tell him to drive down to some lane. That's, that's the technology. Yeah, and I think this is where we see some changes. I mean, a couple of different things. If, if the containers, the shipments were ready to go when the ship arrives, we could, one of two things could happen. You could, you could have the terminals planning their stacks because people have, the cargo's cleared, it's carrier released, and they've got an appointment for the specific day and time. That would allow them to turn around those systems and plan for the exodus of the containers. The other option is we go to a much broader range peel off process where trucks aren't coming in to get a specific container. They're coming in to get a container and the terminals are pinging off a central system to say, I'm going to give this trucker this container. Whose is it? And that means they can continue to the terminal can pull right off the top each time. And you're going to end up with a three or four fold increase in productivity, which means better flow for the truckers. The thing is, the importer is not going to be able to say, I want exactly this trucker at this time. 
Nope. No, they're not. Hey, Bryn, you, th thank you so much for talking to us about some port flows. Unfortunately, we're a little bit low on time, so we're going to have to have you come on another time on the show. But in the meantime, check them out. Trade out tech, tech, check out Trade Tech Inc. And my great guest, Bryn. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Grace, everyone, for stopping by. You can find this show on FW What the Truck anywhere on social. You can find me at Timothy Dooner. That's D O O N E R. Look up What the Truck wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking Channel. 146. We will be back on Wednesday with Project 44's Chet McCandless, Mark Shedler from JJ Keller, Molly Mangan from Echo Globe Logistics, and Teresa DeSantis from Shell Rotella Super Rig winners. Thank you all. Take care. Don't be a stranger.